I don't have any hesitation in saying that Kim Jong-un is the biggest winner of the Ukraine war so far, at least. I do think North Korea's military power will be augmented substantially. And we are delighted today to have uh, one of my colleagues at Defense Priorities has been for several years, Lyle Goldstein, to talk about these issues, especially with North Korea, China, and the situation with Russia and the Russia-Ukraine war, how all of this works together. Lyle is the director, a new apparently, director of the China Initiative at Watson Institute at Brown University, and he is the director of the Asia Engagement Program at Our Defense Priorities. Lyle, welcome to the show. I'm thrilled to be here, Danny. You've been doing a, a great job and happy Independence Day to everyone. Yeah, and, and happy Fourth of July to everybody out there as well and to you and hope you guys, uh, you are able to enjoy most of your day here, but we're grateful that uh, you're sharing part of it with us. And uh, listen, I, I'm, I'm grateful to have you on the show here. We've been trying to get you on for quite a while because you've got such a breadth of knowledge and uh, literally traveling all over the world at uh, a lot of these events uh, in, in, in the Asia Pacific area and really all over the United States as well. So it's a real treat for us to have you on today. Really honored to be here, Danny. I think you've been doing some incredible work on this uh, program informing the public. Well, we, we do. And one of the things, I mean, the, the, the very nature of what we do, the deep dive is, is we like to go beyond the headlines and just, you know, some of the sound bites you see on major news media and even some other shows where they, uh, you know, kind of talk about things that are just going on in the surface. We like to dig deeper so that we can give our audience an understanding of, uh, you know, why things are the way they are and things that you don't normally see so that you can understand the nuance and the complexity, which may help people understand why things on this, that they do see on the surface are the way they are. And and uh, I'm really happy to have you on today specifically about uh, kind of a, I don't know if it's a, a an alliance per se, but the, certainly the increasing cooperation between China, Russia, and North Korea, all of which is having a lot of impact in the Russia-Ukraine war on one side of the earth, and also in the, the Indo-Pacific area on the other side. And uh, these things are all tied together and uh, there's no easy, you know, cuts between one and the other, and uh, you're perfectly uh, positioned to help us understand some of that. Um, so what I want to do is, is first of all, kind of show you a number of uh, comments from some senior administration officials and from some uh, Russian officials about how they're viewing things and kind of get your view on how you think that lines in with reality. And then we're also going to uh, pick up a, a paper that you wrote actually a year ago, which has a number of rather prescient uh, predictions in there or, or assessments, if, if is maybe it's a better word. Uh, and I'd like you to expand on some of it because it's going to have a lot of ramifications for really what we do now based on things that have happened since that paper came out, uh, because the fundamentals that you uh, outlined in there are just as valid today. So first of all, I want to start with uh, John Kirby, um, who talks about the one China principle but I wonder if you can kind of tell us how some how Chinese ears might hear some of this. Here we go. There's not a single discussion that we don't have with senior leaders in the PRC where we don't talk about Taiwan. Of course it came up. Um, I, I won't characterize President Xi's comments, but I can tell you that, that President Biden was very, very clear that, uh, that nothing's changed about our one China policy. We don't support independence for Taiwan, but we also don't want to see the status quo changed in a unilateral way and certainly not by force. Now, Lyle, those words on the surface are, are probably good and stuff that I think China would like to hear. One China principle, no independence, that would be fine. But when China sees some of our actions, they don't seem to see congruity between the two. I wonder if you can explain kind of how China's viewing it and what we might could do better. Yeah, well, thanks again. Um, and, and I appreciate you bringing up the Taiwan issue. I do, you know, as much as I... Uh, I'm, I'm eager to talk about Korea. I do feel like we uh, listeners need to stay focused on Taiwan. Uh, it really is the most dangerous uh, issue in uh, in U.S.-China relations. But but honestly, I, I believe it is the most dangerous issue in the world. Kirby's take there, um, I'm 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 rather impressed. Actually, he he got the wording right, and I think um, you know said it correctly that, uh, you know, we got to safeguard this principle. It is the uh, best uh, route to peace that we have. But, but Danny, you're, you're exactly correct that, um, you know, we, we have sort of been saying one thing and doing another uh, for, for uh, honestly, for really going back more than a decade. Um, and this has put 
U.S. the U.S. and China on the road to war. I, I, you know, I hate to be so dark, but that's the way I view it. And you know, I've, my understanding is that that is, uh, you know, in some ways, the way China uh, understands the Taiwan issue at present. That they're extremely suspicious. You know, uh, again, actions speak louder than words. But you know, we have reports now of 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 some even uh, U.S. troop presence. It's modest, but you, you know. Even that, you know, uh, I suspect has has actually crossed uh, one of Beijing's red lines. So, you know, I, I don't want to be, you know, a doomsayer and give everyone nightmares. But unfortunately, I'm somebody who thinks this could. Uh, we, we unfortunately may be very close uh, to to a conflict over Taiwan. And and what what might be? I, I guess always the issue is what's kind of be or what could potentially be a trigger. Now, I know when the new Chinese uh, president was uh, inaugurated uh, a month or so ago, uh, there was a big issue that China was punishing Taiwan for making uh, incendiary comments, which they said were more democratic than others. We actually had uh, Ambassador Chas Freeman on to talk about that, and he con concurred that actually there was a lot of more pro-independent talk there than before. And then they had this big exercise where they, uh, again, showed how they could blockade the, the nation and, you know, and had all kinds of air and, and naval assets that were engaged in all that. Uh, what do you think is the, the, I guess, the reason for the Taiwanese president's comments. And, for, and first of all, do you agree that they were more uh, independence minded than, say, his predecessor? And where do you see the relations going uh, after that? Uh, yeah, my sense is that uh, the current president of Taiwan, Lai Qingda, he's he is pushing the limits more. Um, and you know, I, some of the rhetoric I've seen from him and the people around him, you know, basically saying that Taiwan doesn't need to declare independence because it already is independent. So, you know, uh, this has had a predictable impact on the mainland and, uh, you know, they, they are stepping up the uh, pressure. And uh, even today, uh, there's a new report of uh, Chinese Coast Guard uh, patrolling much more aggressively. And that may indeed be one tool. You know, this is the Coast Guard issue is one I've investigated over decades, really. But it, it, it is a real you know, tool in China's toolbox to put more pressure, especially as we think how easily that could sort of blur into blockade. Um, but yeah, the... the um, you know, I'm I'm a little reluctant to use the word trigger, honestly, Danny, because I feel that um, the unfortunate truth is China has uh, been considering, uh, you know, military action, military pressure on Taiwan, again, really for more than half a century. For so they will choose a time uh, that's opportune for them. Uh, they're not going to go on our calendar at all. Um, and you know what looks opportune to them. Um, you know, may, may, you know, be something completely unrelated to Taiwan. That is, you know, for example, American politics are in, in a lot of, uh, let's say almost, I would almost say, uh, rather chaotic these days. Well, that, you know, could be seen as advantageous or, but sure. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if, if Russia were to achieve a breakthrough, uh, in Ukraine, for example, and, uh, Europe is in a panic and, you know, the United States also uncertain about its moves in Ukraine, that also could, be viewed as an opportunity. So, uh, look, China has a history of this. Honestly, uh, look at the Sino-Indian War in 1962. Most Americans don't know anything about that war, but it, it was very interesting. That war, uh, it wasn't a coincidence. It took place during the Cuban Missile Crisis, right? It knew the mm -hmm. United States was really distracted, and that's when it chose to act. It acted swiftly and, and closed out that, you know, kind of small war very quickly. So, that's, I, I, unfortunately, I do think that's probably the preferred pattern from Beijing. Now, I'm not saying war is inevitable, nor am I saying that China, you know, China does not want to use force against Taiwan. I'm convinced of that. Yeah, um, in fact, so let me ask are, you that question. There there so, so I've, I've heard, I, I've heard so, some people see, uh, argue that China doesn't want to have a war. They would prefer uh, the... Um, a peaceful unification, which of course they directly say, but also that they could, they've been patient for a half a century and they could be a, a patient for even a lot longer than that going forward, as long as the status quo doesn't change or anybody doesn't make any overt moves towards uh, independence for Ukraine. Just no, on that, first of all, do you, do you agree with yeah, that? But, 
Yes, I do. I do agree with that. And that's a very fundamental point. And, I, you know, I hope Americans, uh, reasonable Americans who, who see that we, you know, we need to have a working, you know, pragmatic relationship with China. Uh, we should not be, you know, kind of searching for a fight or war with China. I mean, this is a, a nuclear armed superpower. And I, I use the word, you know, I don't use the word superpower lightly. China is a superpower. If you don't see that, you know, I suggest you go visit the country, as I do regularly. But um, uh, look, yes, there are a lot of political off ramps. And one of them is the status quo. Now, look, the status quo is changing partly because China is so much more powerful, you know, even than it was a decade ago, you know, certainly than it was two or three decades ago. So the status quo is, is sort of changing and we have to be a little bit flexible. And that means, you know, I think we have to change our views a little bit, um, you know, just at a psychological level. And, you know, part of that is being much more careful with the one China principle, but also not, you know, we don't want to stick it in China's face. You know, uh, these massive arms sales to Taiwan uh, joint. We actually did a joint, uh, the first, to my knowledge, joint exercise with Taiwan since uh, probably since the 1960s. Um, mm. These these do not, you know, this is sticking oh, right. our finger in the dragon's eye. Really bad idea. And, uh, you so, know, yeah, and let me ask you this. This is kind of an important in terms of what we should do, uh, which I'm going to get to in a second. But first of all, I wonder if you could articulate what, as you see it, is America's vital national interest related to Taiwan, China, the, the Straits, that that whole region there? What's in America's interest? What do we? Sh what should we want to see uh, the, the the bottom line exist? Well, in a word, Danny, there is no vital U.S. national security interest in Taiwan, and I, you know, I've, I've said that over and over, and and I challenge uh, others to to make the opposite argument, which, you know, some do. I mean, you know, there are those in Washington who want to argue that it's, you know, it's all about microchips. I don't agree. But, you know, to me, yeah, sure, the price of cars might go up if chips are a little more scarce for a bit. But, the you know, the markets would readjust. Uh, you know, a lot of other countries also make chips. The point is, uh, we're not going to fight World War Three over some chips. But, you know, uh, there's a more strategic argument that, you uh, I th take a bit more seriously, and this is one but made by, you know, Bridge Colby and uh, others, and that is that, that effectively Taiwan is the cork in the Chinese bottle. And if you allow, you know, them to take control of Taiwan, that, that this will kind of, uh, uh, China will unleash aggression on the whole region, sort of following the pattern of Japan in the Pacific War or something. I think that's... Yeah. Uh, that that argument just doesn't hold up. Um, you know, there's just well, correct me if uh, I'm wrong, but I mean, historically, even in, back to the Japan issue, they did have a lot of history of of conquest and and going abroad and search, searching for uh, lands to conquer, etc. But China historically doesn't go abroad doing that. I mean, it's not been in their national character, and it hasn't been since they the communists took over, uh, except for these short, sharp wars you've talked about, but then they stayed within the belt. They don't go out anywhere. So it seems like there is a reasonable presumption that they're not going to use the Taiwan as a as a power projection platform to go conquering anybody else. I mean, is that, do you think that's oh, That's fair? exactly right. I mean, you know, uh, you know, I would argue uh, Taiwan is not, you know, the canary in the coal mine. It is not the kind of trampoline from which they leap to Philippines and to uh, Japan and so forth on, on you know, unleashing some, uh, you know, huge uh, uh, plan of aggression. I mean, look, uh, look, it's just common sense to realize that, that, that times have changed, you know, completely uh, since Japan kind of undertook its uh, war of aggression. Um, and Japan, you're right, Danny, J Japanese culture is, is really uh, quite different. You know, Japan has always uh, celebrated uh, the warrior as the kind of uh, peak uh, prestige in society, you know, the whole samurai uh, honor culture. China really doesn't have that. Uh, and uh, now, now China is becoming somewhat more militaristic. And we, you know, we do have to be careful of that. But, but no, there's just no reason to believe that China is on, has some sort of uh, plans to uh, control uh, uh, East Asia, much less kind of make a kind of, you know, lunge for some greater, you know, global hegemony. Yeah. There's no evidence to support that. In fact, China has not used force uh, in a major way against another country since 1979, which is truly a remarkable record of restraint by a uh, rising global superpower. So now look, I, I don't 
it's not a foregone conclusion that is china might resort to force against one of its neighbors we should give it reasons not to uh yes deterrence is important uh and i i you know i worked for the navy for 20 years so i can tell you i i myself have been involved in in trying to strengthen uh deterrence efforts but more to the point we need uh reasonable flexible diplomacy uh, that meets China halfway on a lot of these questions. I wrote a book called Meeting China Halfway, but that there are compromises to be had. And I do not, uh, you know, looking at Chinese intentions, I don't see any evidence to believe they they are interested in in uh, controlling their neighbors. Outright conquest, yeah, yeah. Because I don't think they gain anything from that. I think that they, they oh, like no. their defenses. Uh, they like their country defended, but they don't they don't seem to have any interest in going abroad. Uh, conquering anyone. Uh, you know, I want to look at, like I said at the outset here, it's not just the one issue here. You can't just look at China, Taiwan. You can't just look at uh, North Korea, South Korea, uh, or even just the Russia Ukraine war, because they, right now, they're all kind of swimming together here. And I want to look here at what the Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken, uh, said not too long ago about the issue of the Ukraine Russia war and China's role in it. 70% of the machine tools that uh, Russia is getting from abroad coming from China, 90% of the microelectronics. So we've been very clear that um, this is doing two things. It's helping Russia perpetuate its aggression against Ukraine, but it's also creating a growing threat to Europe because of Russia's aggression. So for China, if it wants to have better relations, uh, not only uh, with us, but with countries in Europe, it can't do that while at the same time helping to fuel the biggest threat to European security since the end of the Cold War. So, so what do you make of that? The, the, the idea that, that the United States and Europe wants to make sure that China has no influence and no uh, association whatsoever with Russia in regards to its war with uh, Ukraine. Now, China has not overtly given anything out, but there's a number of reports out that they actually help with components and maybe they funnel some stuff through North Korea, et cetera, unsure. But how is that message received in China and are they likely to do what we want? Uh, Danny, they are definitely not uh, inclined to do what we want in this respect. And, you know, Blinken's uh, last visit to Beijing, I think was, you know, he, he was not, uh, taken very seriously at all because he he had came come with a kind of list of demands for China that they uh, you know halt any kind of uh, cooperation uh, that could be construed as, as sort of leaning in the uh, military strategic direction with Russia and that, that you know that they are just unwilling to uh, consider that now I will say um, uh, Beijing has exercised considerable restraint in the Ukraine war. I mean, pe people got to realize when they step back for a minute, this could look a whole lot worse. I mean, if China wanted to uh, change the course of the war in Ukraine, they, they honestly, they could do so very easily. They could send, you know, uh, uh, you know, five or 10 uh, Chinese uh, airborne divisions or ground forces divisions, and uh, th that would make a decisive difference very quickly. Uh, remember what they did do in Korea in uh, the fall of 1950. Right. So, you know, this and China's military is much, much more capable than it was in the fall of 1950. So, right. uh, so, so uh, now, you know, the Russians know and, that. And I'm sorry if I can, you know, I wonder if I, if I could ask you, to, as far as you know, what is China doing? How, how are they helping the Russia uh, uh, war machine, I guess? And what, what is their... Well, let me just start with that first. What what is what are the the Chinese doing for the Russians in any regard? Uh, well, again, I want to emphasize. I think Beijing has acted with a, a decent amount of restraint here. Uh, they have not sent, to my knowledge, they have not sent any weaponry, which is again remarkable. I mean, China has a huge uh, industrial base, a huge uh, you know armaments production. Uh, again, if they wanted to make a difference in this war, again overnight they could send uh, immense quantities of. Uh, you name it, they have it, including, you know, hypersonic missiles. Uh, they have not done that. But uh, on the other hand, uh, you know, and here the Secretary of State has a point uh, in the sense that uh, I don't think Russia would be prevailing in this war uh, if they did not have China backstopping them. Backstopping in what respect? Well, you know, they have continued to become, uh, to, to be a major, major trading partner. And right now, uh, Russia-China trade is ballooning. I mean, it is uh, up by by a huge amount. Um, 
And it's not surprising because uh, Russia has basically succeeded in, in uh, uh, driving its, uh, reorienting its economy uh, toward the East. That was something they were trying to do before the war, but since the war, you know, and they're kind of being excluded from European markets. So that trade, Danny, uh, is essential. It gives uh, Russia mm -hmm. the uh, financial wherewithal, uh, the confidence, um, that its factories are not going to suddenly show, shut down because it is able to export successfully uh, to the Chinese market and the Chinese have uh, welcomed that trade. Although with some, you know, I do think there is some caution, you know, some investment projects have been put on ice. So so I don't want to yeah. say everything is roses in this relationship, but, but China has, you know, look, China has been dealing with U.S. sanctions, like, for example, on Iran for decades. They, they've got this down to a science. I mean, in the sense that they can just create shell company after shell company, mm. uh, move through third parties. I mean, Kyrgyzstan, for example, suddenly has immense trade with both China and Russia. Well, guess what? A lot of the trade is going through these third countries in, say, Central Asia. I, went, I was in Tashkent recently in Uzbekistan. The place is booming on this kind of... Uh, mm, interesting. Uh, I call it the sanctions trade. So that's all going on. And honestly, there's not much. I mean, the United States is now, I think, uh, burning the midnight oil, trying to track all this down. You know, uh, maybe they'll say. So what what what, what, what can we do about any of this? And, and what when you have the secretary of state making that statement there, I mean, he's given a, a, a threat of sorts and saying, hey, if China wants to do business, they better start doing this. And I'm not sure what the this actually is. I don't know what he wants them to stop doing stop having trade? I, I don't know. And what's China's motivation to want to do what he asks? Well, hold on. There's one pillar I still wanted to mention here on China's support, and that is the diplomatic support and the sort of propaganda support, or public relations support. And that has been big. You know, China again and again and again has um, refused to condemn Russia's invasion, has welcomed uh, Putin uh, to their fora, has continued to be very active, um, you know, on, on uh, joint exercises um, and uh, exchanges across the board. Um, and and I think this is particularly important and, and maybe reflective. They, they continue to say over and over again in Chinese sources, and I, I'm somebody who spends a lot of my day looking through Chinese language sources, and you will see over and over again that they... Uh, the Chinese contend, and most Chinese, not all, but most that, uh, and most of the specialist community, that this war really um, resulted from NATO expansion. So they blame NATO um, very frontally, and that has caused China uh, to take a certain disposition. Now there are a few kind of dissident voices in the in the. Uh, you know, I can talk about those, but generally the thrust is China generally is supportive of Russia, and now gets to getting to your question of like, what can we do about this? And the answer is very little, Danny. Uh, th this quasi-alliance between Russia and China, I say quasi-alliance, it's not a full-up alliance. So there are limits, no question about that. Uh, they are not transferring weapons. You won't see Chinese soldiers in Donbass. Um, but uh, it's this quasi-alliance is very broad and very deep. And China, I think, um, it, it, Chinese leaders are, are quite, uh, you know, they believe in this. They believe that Russia has their back and it's reciprocated in Moscow. So, you know, uh, you know, Americans, I think, uh, having, you know, if you maybe studied the Sino-Soviet conflict going back uh, to, the, to the 1960s, I did my dissertation on that, so I'm well versed in it. But a lot of people tend to say, well, you know, Moscow and Beijing ultimately are bound to be in conflict, but th that is really just a, uh, I think a, uh, a poor reading of history. Most well, of history. Well, and history. plus, Lyle, it, it could be. I, I mean, if we had better foreign policies that gave them a reason to want to go back to some of those existing conflicts, but instead we're doing the exact opposite of bringing them closer together, as you see Lavrov talking about here. President Putin and President Xi Jinping have stressed the determination of Russia and China to counter attempts to slow down the formation of a multipolar world, to slow down the long overdue processes of democratization and justice. So they're, they're yeah. going in the opposite direction that we want them to. That's right, Danny. And I, you know, I can't stress uh, enough. You, you, 
you just made the point that's uh, most important. That is, you know, as long as China thinks that we view China as an enemy, and really, if you look at any of our, you know, national security documents and and uh, the discourse in Washington, um, you know, I was just at a meeting, an Istanbul meeting with Chinese experts, and they said, well, you, you have branded us as your enemy. So how do you expect us to react? Of course, we're building up our military forces and our nuclear forces. But at the same time, they are also holding Russia uh, quite closely uh, in such circumstances, right? I mean, if, if, if the U.S. and China are enemies, then it makes sense to ally. You know, the enemy of my enemy is, is my friend. So, of course, China, th that, as you point, you know, this is the cement foundation for the uh, China-Russia quasi-alliance. So, so uh, let it, me ask it you, goes, you just... I, I do want to say it, go, it does go much further than that. You know, there are, you know, cultural, historical ties. Uh, there are natural synergies in both the military and economic field. So I, I don't want to say that's the only uh, uh, foundation, but it is a very strong foundation and it has been built up over decades. So so since you did your dissertation, it's, let me ask, what are some of the historic areas of disputes, I, I guess, or, or disagreements, maybe is a better way to put it, uh, between the two cultures or between the two nations that left alone might at least prevent, you know, this, you know, hand in glove kind of thing and maybe keep it at a little bit more distance. What, what exists there? Well, there are, you know, there are some, um, look, look, if you look across the span of 500 years, five centuries of Russia, China interaction, um, uh, it's actually quite shocking that there are no major wars. Um, but there are uh, there are periods of tension, you know, uh, in the 17th century and then in, in the 19th century, you know, at a certain point, uh, unquestionably, Russia took advantage of China's weakness. Right. China was on its knees in the early you know, 20th century at the end of the 19th century. And, and Russia uh, gobbled up lots of territory. But, you know, the truth is uh, that territory was not, uh, in my view, really um, you know, let's say a, a uh, uh, you know, a, a settled part of China uh, or even traditional China. So, you know, to me, again, Westerners tend to exaggerate the territorial issue. Sure, sure like in any, uh, you know, the U.S. and Mexico, let's not forget, for a while we uh, had <laughs> a rather disputed what border, which resulted in war. But so uh, really uh, China and Russia have not experienced that kind of uh, major war over the border, but there was a, you know, in 1969, there was a, a very significant skirmish that involved, you know, even a, a nuclear dimension. So, so in the back, I, I do think even today in the back of the minds of, of Russian and Chinese leaders, there's a little bit of fear that, oh, back in the fifties, this was a, you know, a golden kind of period in Russia, China relations where, where Moscow and Beijing were very tightly linked. And that all went out the window very quickly. So that kind of, there is a kind of a little bit of historical shadow, a lingering mistrust, a, a hesitation to get too close, to get too dependent on both sides. There is, you know, I, I won't deny there is a, a demographic issue where where they're just the, the Russian Far East is not very uh, populated. So, you know, prospects for defense, if there were to be a Chinese invasion, are are uh, not good. It would probably go nuclear very quickly. Um, but look, talk like this is honestly is is kind of irresponsible. There's just no hint of uh, militarization anymore yeah. in that relationship. And and I think the degree of trust is very high. I don't think, uh, you know, China is planning to uh, try to conquer uh, Lake Baikal or Vladivostok or anything like that. And, yeah. and uh, it's really a very relaxed environment there. And I, I honestly don't see really prospects for change there. But, you know, as you said, like both sides welcome the idea of a multipolar world. And, um, you know, that's a, a pretty strong uh, concept for um, both governments moving forward. But it implies, a, again, a bit of a limit and, and some restraint. And here I think the Chinese are quite wise. Russia is, is kind of desperate, right? They're at war. They really need as much Chinese help as the Chinese will give. So they are more inclined to think in terms of alliance. China's more cautious. You know, China is clearly the big dog here. They're in the driver's seat of this relationship. And they realize that a firm linkage with Russia would be destabilizing for the you know, entire world and would yeah. drive you know, the Europeans and the Americans crazy. So they're not, you know, they are 
they're putting a limit on this. They don't want a firm alliance with Russia, and we shouldn't drive them to seek one. Yeah, and so clearly the China is in the driver's seat because they're not at war with anybody, number one, and they also have the either the world's number one or number two uh, economy, depending on how you want to view it. So they want to keep all that stuff going. But while they're in the front seat and, and Russia is in the passenger seat, there's another person in that vehicle in the back seat, and that's Kim Jong-un. Uh, and uh, that's a, another thing, a part of this burgeoning. If, if, I don't know if, if even quasi-alliance is the right term. Maybe it is, but it's definitely closing in or a coalescing of folks who America is considered adversaries getting closer together. And the most recent one is with North Korea, where uh, just a month ago, less than a month ago, Russia signed an agreement with North Korea that has specific military dimensions to it. Here was Vladimir Putin speaking from Pyongyang, talking about how he sees uh, the, the, the world and his role in it. Time and again, the West is uh, using its uh, tired propaganda cliches but they're clearly ineffective in realizing its goals, including in Asia. This confrontational policy pursued by the United States to expand its military infrastructure in the region goes hand in hand in the growing scale of military exercises involving South Korea, Japan, and they're clearly hostile with regard to the DPRK. Such steps undermine peace and stability on the peninsula and threaten the security of all the countries in Southeast Asia. Now, I think we can understand that any uh, head of state that gives a speech, especially after he just signed some agreement, will exaggerate the conditions uh, that drove him to it. But I, I got to think that there's, there's a kernel of truth in there, at least from Russia's perspective, that a hostile policy, and I know that's a phrase used by North Korea against the United States for decades since I was serving in South Korea in the, the late 1990s. Uh, but the fact that they have now signed some agreements, which makes it a lot closer than it was, uh, you know, in the year 2000, when I think Putin first went to, to South Korea, how do you, or to North Korea, sorry, how do you view that situation and how much is true about what Putin said and how much is hyperbole? Well, I think the two are, are getting very close now. Um, you know, I'm, I'm pretty comfortable with using the term alliance. I mean, they're, uh, you know, now, again, I think there will be some kind of practical limitations here. I mean, you know, if for no other reason, I think Putin, um, you know, it will not look good if, if suddenly uh, we have uh, large groups of, of North Korean soldiers, you know, fighting in Ukraine. That will just, you know, it, it might... Uh, uh, imply some kind of weakness in the Russian army or something like that. So I think I think you know there there are reasonable limits to this, um, but there are real incentives and and real synergies here. So I would say you know in contrast, we've just been talking about Russia China relations, where where there I would say there are a, a decent amount of limitations, and China is in, clearly in the driver's seat here. Um, you know it is more of a kind of equal and very, you know, synergistic relationship in that both sides can see, you know, can plan to realize some, some very tangible near-term benefits, you know, for, for Russia, obviously that means munitions. And I think uh, Washington Post is reporting now something like 11,000 containers of munitions are being transported, you know, from, from uh, the far East there to, and reaching the Ukrainian battlefield. So, so this seems to be making a difference on the battlefield. And, you know, we've been talking a long time about uh, Russia's really vast superiority in, uh, say, artillery munitions. Um, so, so certainly North Korea is playing into that. Um, and, you know, there's, there's talk of more. But I think for, for North and, Korea... And, and, and what is North Korea getting out of it? Yeah. 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 For North Korea, the benefits are immense here. And, and this is a country that's been under uh, an incredible incredibly um, uh, 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 tough sanction regime, uh, you know, for, for really for decades. And, and so a country that has suffered starvation, uh, a country that, you know, hasn't been able to keep the lights on or the factories uh, cranking, and that has been, you know, incredibly isolated, a true kind of hermit kingdom and has had bad, you know, uh, let's say, not bad, but but let's say poor and tense relations with China, who's generally seen as 
as um, you know the primary support for the Kim regime. So, so this is a big, uh, a really big change. And I, you know, I, I don't have any hesitation in saying that Kim Jong Un is the biggest winner of the of the uh, mm. Ukraine war so far, at least. I mean, he his position is fundamentally changed. The prospects for North Korea are. Uh, I think significantly improved. After all, you know, Russia is, is Russian agriculture has really taken off over the last two decades, and it's a, a major exporter of food. So that's you know, at a minimum, uh, this is a huge help. Um, yeah. I, I've actually been down to that border where um, where Russia, China, and North Korea meet. I was down there mm. in uh, uh, yeah at the end of 2017, and I, I crossed that border. I was did this when I was a U.S. government <laughs> official, so it was quite unusual, uh, and I don't think any other U.S. government officials had been in that area, but I, I, in that, when, walking around in some of these Russian villages right around the border, the Russians were very, very um, anxious that the border be open to trade, um, and many of them had been to North Korea in previous times and were angry at the Russian government for, for enforcing the sanctions so uh, stringently. So mm. yeah, this will uh, allow a lot more trade. I think they're starting to work on a new bridge there, uh, and you know already the shipping trade, like I said, uh, in munitions primarily, but in many other things. But look, I do think North Korea's military power will be augmented substantially. Uh, we can talk about that if if you want. But Russia has um, yeah yeah. Oh, I do lot. want to talk about that. Yeah, what that's what I'm saying. Uh, what aside from food or whatever, what militarily does uh, does uh, Pyongyang gain from this, and and prior to this, Russia seemed to have kind of a, a distance between them, but now then they're coming really close together. So, what is Russia going to give them now that they might not have before? Mm -hmm. Well, well, let me a couple of points to add quickly. That that um, for one, it's not just food; it's also going to be uh, energy, and of course, you know, Russia is a huge you know oil and gas superpower. Uh, one of the biggest producers in the world. So, so, and that's exactly what North Korea needs, and and has been, you know, honestly, um, almost strangled. Uh, uh, so this will change again, changes North Korea's prospects uh, almost immediately. Um, but um, uh, as far as their, um, you know, and and I I want another thing worth mentioning up front here is that. One reason Russia, why did Russia enforce these sanctions so stringently over the last uh, decade? I'll tell you, the answer is clear, China. Uh, and I had this, ex when I visited Vladivostok at the end of 2017, you know, I, I asked, I was specifically going there to study the uh, evolving Korean situation, which if you'll recall was in crisis at that time. Yeah. And I asked the Russians, you know, what is your approach on North Korea? And they said, they said, Professor Goldstein, in all candor, our approach is whatever China tells us to do. <laughs> and they, they actually said, they said, in when it comes to Syria, China sort of follows Russia's lead. When it comes to North Korea, you know, we do what China tells us to do. Now, that has changed, I think, here we can say. And, and you know, you asked about points of China-Russia tension here. I, you know, there is, I think, some differences may be emerging. I don't think there are major differences. We can talk about that. You know, what is China's approach? But back to your question about the military augmentation here. Um, well, it can be very simple things. I mean, North Korea's conventional armaments are quite backward. Uh, I, I know for a fact uh, from uh, Chinese writings that North Korea is very uh, eager to learn the lessons from the Ukraine war, like all militaries around the world, you know, implementing the use of drones uh, uh, so forth. Um, but, um, you know, simple things like, like tanks, you know, building a modern tank, you know, they, they're, they're going to learn a lot from, from the Russians. I mean, we all know a North Korean equipment often is, uh, derivative of those early Soviet designs that they gained in the, uh, you know, in the fifties and sixties. But of course that, you know, to put it mildly, North Korea's air force is, is, uh, almost a, um, you know, there's nothing there to speak of, but could it be totally revamped now? Uh, it's air defense system, absolutely. So those are the basic things, but the two areas, uh, Danny, that I think could make the biggest difference in the near term, one, I'm not even gonna talk about nuclear weapons because I think there probably Russia is reticent to to really get involved, but, uh, but we can say um, North Korea's space program, it's uh, access to yeah. satellite, uh, you know, satellite technology, uh, you know, mi missile and launch technology, maybe to some respect, 
uh, in some respects. But then I'm particularly worried about uh, North Korea's submarine program. And uh, here, you know, North Korea has a has a large submarine force. They're, they've actually tested uh, submarine launch ballistic missiles, if you can believe that. That's a, a, a very, uh, you know, that's kind of the cutting edge or the holy grail, you know, of uh, honestly, of, of uh, naval strategic uh, uh, weaponry. But uh, they haven't pulled it off yet. But I mean, I'm just saying, um, if North Korea is looking to radically improve its submarine force, which it may indeed do and could that could become a threat to um, countries in Northeast Asia, then uh, Russia, let's say, has very ample experience with uh, advanced submarines. So, yeah. so there's uh, that's a concern as well. Uh, can I make one more point, Dan? Sure. Uh, I, I realize we're probably um, uh, going over time, but the, the um, I do wanna say here just quickly that I don't think it had to be this way uh, to my estimate, um, we've made some mistakes um, uh, along the lines that you said earlier, kind of pushing our, our uh, you know, let's say competitors uh, to cooperate in a large way. But it, to my estimate, you know, when, after Russia invaded Ukraine, the whole world was stunned. At that moment, I think both Seoul and Tokyo took decisions, I think, which maybe were a bit rash. And uh, here I'll just say... Um, you know, my view is that a lot of what we're seeing today is the outcome of those kind of rash uh, developments here. Um, and for example, let me give you an example. President Yoon of South Korea, um, he attended the NATO summit in uh, Vilnius in mid-2023, about a year ago. You know, how do you think that looked in, you know, to Russia? Um, and there's also been all kinds of rumors about South Korean munitions flowing into um, the Ukraine's army. So, you know, I, I've been watching this for a while and I think uh, Moscow, you know, the Kremlin finally uh, had become fed up with it, uh, frustrated. Uh, previously, I will say, Seoul and Moscow were able to maintain, you know, pragmatic and even positive relations. Uh, I, you know, for a long time, South Korea had a lot of influence in Moscow. That's all, you know, been thrown out the window. And um, I think, that, they're going to be cost to this uh, more uh, confrontational policy. And that, that's what we're seeing play out now. So uh, unfortunately, you know, th as in everything in strategy, it's kind of an action and action reaction, chicken and egg, you know, yeah. both sides are responding to uh, provocations by the other side. But I do think uh, Seoul might have played this more carefully. And I do note that President Yoon is not attending um, the uh, Best NATO festivities, I I think uh, in Washington now. In Washington and, uh, that week, probably yeah. is kind of a bit more caution <clears throat> right, Steve, here because we you, don't uh, want to see the we don't want to see the Ukraine war come to Northeast Asia. No, we don't want to see. That. Absolutely not. I don't want to see that would shut down where it is, much less expand. Uh, let exactly. me ask you real quick before we shift gears here, uh, specifically about North Korea. Do you have any knowledge about what their capacity is to continue supplying Russia? Do you know what their domestic industrial capacity is to make one five two millimeter artillery shells for example uh on a on an ongoing basis so that they themselves don't get into their wartime stocks do you have any knowledge of that well look um i you know there you probably want to talk to a you know real um well qualified north korea expert although you know Amer americans generally don't go to north korea um i i do follow the country closely um Here's my my quick take. There is is look, North Korea has surprised us over and over and over with its uh, remarkable progress in creating an ICM. Uh, you know, I remember people. Uh, you know, when I was at Naval War College, you know, for 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 years, people would kind of laugh. You you really think they can build an ICBM? You know, ha ha ha. Well, and then they kept surpassing all of our expectations, yeah. kind of off the charts, uh, in shock. Uh, about how far uh, their military has gone. Um, and I'm one who thinks if, if it were to come to war between the US and North Korea, that we would pay a very heavy price, that, that, that North Korea, I don't doubt for a minute, would inflict high costs. Now, look, I'll be the first to say North Korean society has huge problems, uh, you know, not to mention uh, just you know, immense repression and uh, curtailing of, of free speech and everything else that prevents them from being an innovative uh, country like like South Korea, of course, and their economy is much smaller. Uh, they've suffered 
you know, literally from, from insufficient food and energy. So there were many roadblocks, but, you know, all that said, you know, there's a few things that a country uh, set up like North Korea can do well in building, you know, a heck of a lot of artillery shells is one of them. And it is a fairly industrialized country. I mean, way back when, in fact, uh, industrial indicators going back uh, a few decades, actually their, their industry was, was even more um, uh, built up um, than, than in South Korea. Of course, that's all changed, but, but still in, the, in, the, in terms of just raw kind of factories and, and, and labor that you can put at this, yes, I would say, um, I, I, I would and then think I guess that as you North said earlier, if they, if they get yeah. some energy and, and raw materials from Russia, they could even yes. do more on their Exactly. Capacity. So it's, it really is a very uh, synergistic relationship. And you can see why. I mean, in some ways, the mystery is why did this happen earlier? Because the two countries are. And here, yeah. I think you have to say that, <laughs> that, that it was Russia playing very carefully because it didn't want to upset China. So again, China, you know, we, we come back to China that it yeah, and then we also a, come back then again to the Russia-Ukraine war and everything that we've done as a result of that has had cascading yes. effects that are not positive for our side. Uh, now, I want to shift gears here a little bit um, to, to something you wrote a year ago uh, or nearly a year ago uh, called the Bipolarity Paradox, a preliminary assessment of the implications of the strengthening China-Russia quasi-alliance for the Korean Peninsula. And that's that has had a lot of uh, ramifications. You, you also spoke at that time about the the imp impact of the Russia-Ukraine war. And I want to pull uh, three specific things that you wrote in there and get you to, uh, I guess, explain a little bit on what you had. On the first one, uh, you were talking about uh, a major impact of the Ukraine war appears to be a further consolidation of alliance structures in the Asia-Pacific region, including between the U.S., Japan, South Korea. At the same time, North Korea has resumed rapid pace of missile deployment, and Pyongyang has also counted uh, by overly, overtly reaching out to energize its old friendship with Moscow. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how the war changed that, because you literally just kind of touched on that, that before there had been kind of a distance between Moscow and Pyongyang. Now then it's, uh, you know, a close handshake. How did that develop? Yeah, and I mean, uh, I made this point briefly earlier, but just to return to that, but I mean, I, I can't emphasize enough that I think previously the policy in Seoul had been very pragmatic. I mean, President Moon, who came before President Yoon, but President Moon had actually gone to Moscow and had actually given a speech to the Duma, which I thought was a quite an encouraging uh, overture back then. But, but yeah, I mean, now um, uh, I, I think... Unfortunately, uh, what we've seen, and you know, th this happened in the West also. We're no stranger to this in Washington, but uh, you know, the the Ukraine war has caused everybody to kind of uh, be in shock and kind of embrace uh, a very kind of uh, black and white view of the world. You know, where ideology is ascendant above all. And I think, in some ways, this uh, honestly. It, well, this is a curious episode, but I, I wish somebody would look into this. But President Yoon, uh, his his electoral victory, um, which was pretty substantial, I think, happened actually just a couple of weeks after the Ukraine war. So I think actually his victory could be partly explained by that. That is, mm. you know, pe people were fearing this kind of new and dangerous world and thinking, well, let's put in these uh, conservative hawks who are who are going to stand up to North Korea. So. So, but but he ran with this, and I, I would say Japan has also run with this, and Japan is is now building up its military and very active. And anyway, um, you know, it stands to reason that if you increase your uh, you know alliance activities, that the other side is going to uh, react. And you know, we talked about China a minute ago, and what's China's perception? But China is watching all this too, and their take from what I can gather of the Kim Putin summit is that actually, you know, they seem to view this as a positive for Chinese security. That is, uh, you know, uh, that Russia and North Korea at least kind of will uh, take the attention of, of Japan and South Korea, you know, as competitors. Now, look, going back more than a decade, Washington has done everything it could, pulling out all the stops to try to get Seoul and Tokyo on the same page and get them talking and actively cooperating. And I don't have anything against that. I think it's, you know, it's positive to see these two countries cooperating. There's a lot of bitterness in that relationship. Right. 
you know, a lot of history. You all know that you all know the history of the comfort women and all that, and then really uh, Japan's you know colonial, um, you know, very poor treatment of the Koreans over over in in a very dark time uh, before the Second World War. So that's all there, but but the U.S. has been doing everything it can to cement over that. But I think they fail to realize that if you actually succeed in getting this kind of uh, Northeast Asian, uh, call it Northeast Asian Entente or something, uh, between um, uh, South Korea, Japan, and, and the U.S., that there would be a counter reaction, that, that this would help cement the bloc on the other side. So I, in my view, we, we should be much more careful and cautious here. I mean, South Korea is an immensely powerful country, right? Their economy is so dynamic. Uh, technologically, they're a world leader. Honestly, they don't need any help defending themselves, in my view. They're so yeah. uh, vastly superior to North Korea. In fact, that's part of the reason North Korea built, built nuclear weapons, because they had no other defense against uh, not just South Korea's impressive conventional armaments, but South Korean K-pop. Yes, K-pop. I mean, in other words, like the, right. the South Korea is a full package. It has soft power and hard power. So it's a huge threat to North Korea as they perceive it. So they need they just need anything. And nuclear weapons were part of the answer. But we got to realize that the balance of power vastly favors our side here, uh, even uh, even with China growing. Um, uh, you know, South Korea is not threatened. Japan is not threatened, nor are we, and we should. We just need to uh, relax a little bit, and and in my view, um, actually, you know, see some benefits from a, a kind of more multipolar system. Now, now going back to that article, why did I call this a bipolarity paradox? It's partly because the the Korean situation has been so, so unstable, right? We've been, you know, I was down at the border uh, several times. I've, I've visited the peninsula many times in the last few years. I can tell you it's it's been uh, very scary. We all thought we were on the brink of a nuclear war back in 2017, 2018. It's easy to forget that, you know, with all that's happened with the Ukraine war. But I'm saying in the short term, there could be some benefit here. Why do I say that? Because we were all worried about North Korea becoming completely unhinged, you know, and I've always said that one of the scariest things about the Korean Peninsula is the so-called pitchfork scenario. What's the pitchfork scenario? It's a situation where North Korea is so um, isolated, suffering starvation. Well, the North Koreans rise up and come into the square and say, you know, we want Kim's head on a pitchfork here, the pitchfork scenario. Well, what, what does Kim do then? You know, does he pull out the box, look at the red button, say, I'm, I'm done for. I'm going to take Tokyo with me, maybe Seattle and Honolulu too. Unfortunately, I think that's that scenario is all too real. So, you know, in the nuclear age, we just have to realize that um, we've got to engage with North Korea. We've got to realize that North Korea is going to engage with Russia and China, that that's not a horrible thing, that actually Beijing, which has been generally cautious, uh, and even Russia can act as a restraint on North Korea. Um, and I think that that is a more kind of enlightened view. And we might see that in the short term, things may even become slightly more stable. In other words, if North Koreans can can have food on the table, yeah, uh, they may settle have down. A lot and less focus need to do anything else. Itself. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I want to I want to go to a different aspect uh, of of the war in uh, Russia Ukraine and its impact on here, uh, especially in a conventional sense. Uh, Gary, if you could pull up slide through number three, there, uh, you wrote that another consequence of the Russia Ukraine war is that North Korea is hard at work absorbing the military lessons of the Ukraine war. Notably, this has been a new emphasis on upgrading North Korean conventional military forces with a particular focus on armor, rocket forces, and air defenses that could be more appropriate to a flexible multi-domain combat environment. So even aside from whatever Russia can give them, it's probably access to probably classified after action reports on the ground so that they can actually improve their combat forces. And then also I think a change what kind of armaments that they focus on to, to produce. And you mentioned some of there with the air defense and the rocket forces, et cetera. I wonder if you can uh, kind of characterize, if you will, how important that is to North Korea. And does that change anything about the conventional dynamic between North and South Korea? Well, I do think, you know, I'm glad you touched on that because it is an important dynamic. And I think one uh, kind of very disturbing aspect of the Ukraine war, the Russia-Ukraine war, is that 
you know, now we have the two most combat experienced armies in the world now are Ukraine, of course, and the Russian army. Um, do you think that China is interested in that knowledge? Oh, yeah. yeah. Do you think North Korea is interested in that knowledge? I mean, I, one reason I, I suspect that North Korean volunteers are on the way, you know, volunteers, of course. Um, why will there be? I do think there will be, you know, quite possibly we don't. It's not confirmed, but there may well be North Korean units uh, going to Ukraine for this very reason that they um, they want to see how their weapons are working. They uh, want to see what you know what the latest and greatest on the battlefield is, and yes, they want the combat experience. You know, combat experience. I mean, for all we talk about. Uh, security issues in East Asia. The truth is the, the you know, really since the, let's see, since the Vietnam War, there really hasn't been a big war in Asia. Thank goodness. And let, we'd like to keep it that way. But that means that all these militaries uh, in East Asia, including the, even the South Korean military, Japanese uh, uh, self-defense forces and, and China's armed forces are not, they're not combat experience at all. So this, this is important, but, but your, your point there that you could have some change, um, in the, uh, in North Korea's, I mean, uh, yeah, I think you potentially here, you have the prospects for, um, significant change in North Korea's trajectory across the board. Um, uh, so, you know, yes, I, I know that our, our, our first take on that is, wow, that's disturbing, you know, North Korea was in its box, now it's not. But I do urge people to think in a more kind of comprehensive way that it could probably be a little bit more stable. You know, I don't think they're gonna even out that conventional balance with South Korea. I mean, South Korea, again, I can't say this strongly enough that this is a country, you know, this is a country that consistently, um, I think exceeds uh, our metrics for military preparation in terms of having ready reserves. I think they have well over a million in reserves that take their reserve duty seriously mm. um, and, and in its preparation. So South Korea and its economy is, is similarly robust. Not to say that South Korea is ready to fight. I don't think they want to at all. Yeah. And I generally commend uh, the restraint that uh, Seoul has has um, has adopted in, in crisis after crisis, but, you know, I don't, you know, so, but I don't think that the Russian assistance will will make a huge difference there, but it will make some difference, sure. Uh, then, yeah, and I, th I think you covered that pretty good there. Um, and, and to kind of to wrap this up a little bit, I, I want to talk uh, briefly uh, about what's going on in in uh, uh, Kazakhstan. I think it is right now, where uh, Vladimir Putin yesterday landed uh, and uh, for, for a conference there where he's apparently going to meet with Xi Jinping again. And he just met with uh, uh, the Chinese leader in, in a bilateral way not too long ago. Now here's another one here. <clears throat> and do you put any significance with, with what uh, Russia and or China, and I don't know if North Korea is involved with this particular meeting, but do you see any uh, extenuating things going in a direction you're not comfortable with here? Well, look, um, <clears throat> You know, Central Asia, I, I was just in Central Asia, uh, you know, during late 2023. Uh, I have visited Kazakhstan as well, though it was not on this trip. But, uh, you know, look, I mean, Central Asia is a, a very interesting place. As I said before, uh, they, they are actually uh, benefiting quite handsomely from the Ukraine war because a lot of uh, trade that used to go through other uh you know, other uh, routes is now being routed through Central Asia. So it's a little bit paradoxical. I think I do think Kazakhstan would be in the running for countries that have benefited <laughs> most. But um, but look, generally, you know, I'm I'm reasonably encouraged. Uh, uh, look, when the U.S. pulled out of Afghanistan, you know, partly in thanks to your uh, incredible work on that front, and, and that's something I'll never forget. And uh, where, where you uh, earned my uh, huge admiration. Uh, and I'm glad we did pull our forces out, but you know, arguably our influence declined, you know, radically in Central Asia, uh, in that neighborhood, and yet the region, you know, did not, you know, fall into collapse, uh, become uh, didn't become a kind of haven of, right. of radicalism. Uh, in fact, most of those Central Asian republics uh, did not. Uh, want to become like Afghanistan at all. And, uh, you know, they, they follow a course of pragmatic cooperation. So, you know, I'm, I'm uh, modestly encouraged. Um, I do think some of them have been disturbed by what's going on in Ukraine. And let's not forget what happened in Ukraine 
it could actually happen in Kazakhstan. Uh, we all hope it does not. And I think Kazakhstan, you know, the, the, their leadership is smart. They know, you know, they're squeezed between two Eurasian giants, China and Russia. Well, they better get along with both of them. And yeah. that means, you know, um, feeling their pain, uh, trading with them and having, you know, uh, uh, you know, solid relationships that they um, safeguard, you know, and that, that explains, you know, the very frequent meetings. Um, yeah, for China, Kazakhstan matters a lot for Russia, too. There's a lot of Russians in Kazakhstan, just like in Ukraine. So there are a lot of analogies, but but I think Kazakhstan's policies are 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 really much much wiser yeah um, but but yeah we will have to watch uh, central yeah. asia as kind of to, it'll help us understand where the russia china uh quasi alliance is going at this point i don't you know i don't see a lot of conflicts though they seem to have settled into kind of china leads with commerce and russia kind of leads with its sort of geopolitics strategy and energy so that sort of uh uh kind of um uh, yeah, so it's just kind of solidifying a certain, things. A certain <laughs> complementary role, and that we may see that also play out in uh, the Middle East and and Northeast Asia too. Uh, one of the last things I wanted to to sh I guess talk to you about is uh, one of the warnings that you gave in in this uh, this article from from a year ago. Gary, if you could throw that last slide up there, <clears throat> you wrote that the West and its close allies in East Asia should recognize that the situation is delicate and could suddenly become much more fraught. For example, if major quantities of North Korean military equipment or even DPRK volunteers were to appear in the Donbass, understanding such major risk of an escalation spiral, decision makers on both sides of this divide are urged to act with due caution and restraint. And that's what you said before. And now since that time, there has been the overt military in a deal that was signed between Russia and North Korea. And as you just mentioned a second ago, reports are now that uh, North Korean volunteers in some number, engineers, I think is what's being reported, are in fact headed over uh, into that conflict. Now, we don't know where that's going to go, but some of the th one of the things you warned to get uh, have, have already come to pass. So from where we are now, what do you what do, are you watching for and what kind of concerns might you have uh, for things to be going in a, in a worse direction? Mm -hmm. Well, I think, you know, to me, um, I, you know, I am very concerned that this could um, prompt a series of, of uh, escalations. Um, you know, I, I, it's an unknown, you know, what, what quantity might these troops show up in? Are they, you know, prepared to do, uh, you know, truly the dirty work of combat? I mean, as you know, uh, combat engineers are, you know, right there up at the front. They're not they're not in the back and they're doing some exceedingly dangerous jobs um, uh, like clearing minefields and things like that. So, uh, but, you know, I don't even doubt that, that, you know, combat engineer could mean, could mean anything. And, and right. therefore, uh, I mean, so, so the first question is, could, could they, you know, have a real different, you know, make a, a real difference on the ground. And I, you know, I, I would not rule it out entirely. I mean, you know, I, I don't doubt that, you know, we know from our study of North Korea's armed forces over time that they have a very large uh, special forces component. We also know that their, you know, ideology plays a huge role in their um, in their their training and so forth. So, so the fact that they would be well trained, probably highly motivated, you know, they could be, uh, uh, you know, uh, also eager to kind of make a make a splash, make a difference. So, so I'm concerned, you know, that and and how would Europe react to to that kind of uh, uh, set of developments? Now, I, I personally suspect that that Russia is a little uneasy about this. You know, that they don't want somebody else to. Um, you know, as it were, win their war, steal their glory, uh, you know, or, or I don't think Russia is eager to want to thank North Korea for, you know, you know, delivering military victory or something like that, you know, it would just be sort of un, uh, you know, take the spotlight from their own uh, military achievements. So, so I, I, I don't think that will come to pass, but I, I my sense is Russia is quite clever here. Um, and they view this as kind of matching Western escalation. So, so this really came about because we've had rumors of, of uh, European, you know, whole European contingents like a French contingent in Ukraine. And so, so I think they're going to play, you know, a game of sort of parallel escalation. If there are going to be European, you know, real European contingents, well, there's, the Volunteer Legion has been there for a long time, but we're talking about, 
you know, and and there's been suspicions that the Patriot units are manned by, uh, you know, by by foreigners. But I think uh, Russia is saying you want to bring uh, foreigners into this for real, uh, you know, in, in a major way, then we have our, our own uh, force of foreigners. There, by the way, there are also uh, rumors about um, uh, Afghan and Syrian uh, soldiers who who uh, can play a role in Ukraine as well. So so I think Russia is trying to be clever here. But they, in general, I, I don't Russia doesn't have a big appetite for escalation. They don't want to go there. They think you know, they're basically winning this as it's going. They're watching yeah. the politics too, and they're they're generally kind of pleased with how it's unfolding. So I don't, now, could we break this cycle um, with with more reasonable approaches? I think, you know, Right, right, honestly, that's exactly what I was gonna ask. Given given the messy situation that exists right now, no, not what we wish we existed, but what does exist, what can the United States do in the West at large, but primarily the US, what can we do diplomatically or, or militarily any other way to lessen the chances that this thing uh, escalates uh, and that these things don't keep going in a direction that are not helpful to our side? Well, honestly, I, I think uh, Seoul and Tokyo have some impressive cards here to play. Um, and I don't, you know, I, I mostly try to keep my advice giving to, to Washington decision makers, but insofar as our allies um, are influential here, look, you know, I, I'm well acquainted with the good relations that uh, both South Korea and Japan maintained with with um, Russia for decades. And, you know, we talk a lot in, in the East Asia field about Shinzo Abe. I mean, here was a prime minister who had, uh, you know, immense uh, influence in Japanese strategy and Japanese foreign policy. Uh, but one of his major contributions was he, he kept at trying to improve the ja Japan-Russia connection and he you know they abe and um and um putin met you know dozens of times and had a really good rapport and japan russia relations are very strong why do i say this because we want to lead russia away from this kind of rogue status and that rogue status includes cooperating with other rogues like iran and north korea so if you're going to try to open some channels what i'm saying is you've got to offer the kremlin some carrots uh, Russia's yeah. moving in a really dangerous direction. Serious. They're they're going, you know, it's plausible that they will go all out to win in, in Ukraine, that they will go all out to help North Korea. They're, the clear way to kind of stop those trends is to dangle some carrots and say, hey, you know, if, if Seoul were to say, you make some overtures to the Kremlin, say, look, we want to preserve good relations. We want to continue to work with you. By the way, the Arctic is one area where Korea and Russia have very aligned interests. You know, Korean shipping could benefit hugely from uh, the northern sea route across the Arctic. So, and Korea, South Korea was very involved in that. They were designing icebreakers for Russia. Uh, and getting ready to build them in Vladivostok together with Russia. All that Korean technology was very useful to Russia. So when that was cut off, that was a big message to the Kremlin, you know, uh, saying, okay, now comes a period of confrontation. Well, how did the Kremlin respond by turning to North Korea? So I think Seoul uh, and to some extent Tokyo, if they act judiciously with American encouragement, could, you know, try to break down this new Cold War, try to build... Um, back some of these uh, engagement efforts. We don't, again, we don't want this war in Eastern Europe to spread into Asia, but that's unfortunately what, you know, the overall trend is. This new Cold War is just deepening with all kind of escalation danger. So we need uh, the realism and yeah. the strength that you're always advocating to uh, get us back to a safer spot. And that will help yeah, the, you know, one of the things, Lyle, that it just, you know, I guess, kind of infuriates me a little bit is that, is that there has been, especially since, uh, you know, 9-11, there's just been this almost exclusive focus on the military component to try to solve problems to, to the exclusion of diplomacy. Uh, it seems like we only use diplomacy to the, uh, it's like to say, well, we'll tell you what to do. And if you do it, cool. If not, then we go to military as opposed to trying actual diplomacy where there's sticks and carrots and you actually try to seek a win-win situation because what should help America the most is to, to solve problems, to minimize security risk at the lowest cost possible. And there's a lot better ways to do that than what we've been doing. And I'd love to see some of your ideas uh, turn into actual policies uh, heading forward. Thanks. Yeah, we have, you know, our country as uh we have so many uh, carrots that, and and this we're 
we're still admired around the world. And, um, you know, I, I wish the uh, foreign policy and defense community would, would really focus much more attention on carrots and how to incentivize, you know, cooperative relations rather than, you know, we tend to spend all our efforts figuring out what new uh, cool weapon system is going to, right. uh, you know, and how much bigger the defense department needs to be and, and all yeah, that. And, yeah. and it just reorient the whole uh, cooperative, co cooperative uh, endeavors versus deterrence calculation, which is, right now is so heavily skewed toward uh, well, war fighting, but deterrence generally, and uh, that that needs to change. Um, and and look, I'll, can I just say this out loud? Our our focus in the what we, what you just accurately described has had disastrous results. So before the Russia Ukraine yes. war and all the things we've done since that time, Russia and 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 uh, North Korea were. At, I think you used the word equidistance elsewhere in your paper. Uh, China and and Russia were kind of at. at they were close, but they weren't. They weren't like this. And and then yes. uh, Iran, they didn't have anything militarily going on. All those things have resulted because of what we've been doing. Everything screams we need a new policy. We need a new direction, like you say. Yeah, I mean, on that point, Russia had pr Russia didn't Russia's position with China. This is sort of pre uh, pre twenty twenty two, but even you know somewhat in the um, you know after 2014, 2015, Russia was trying to make sure it had a balanced relationship in East Asia. That is, it wanted to have very strong relations with South Korea and very strong relations with Japan and the United States. They did not want to be totally dependent on China and they don't, still don't want that. Uh, so they were looking for other options. But the bottom line, Danny, and I know you say this all the time, but we got to put muscle back into diplomacy, you know, have diplomats do diplomacy, you know, try to solve right. problems. Use the right, creativity, right, right. use those carrots. You know, we just don't have that today. And it's a huge, you know, we're really paying the cost in terms of conflict spiraling everywhere. <sighs> We do, and let's let's hope that uh, if if uh, if there's a new administration next year, that they'll do some of these things, and or if the current administration gets a second shot, that they'll start to at least recognize that some of the things they have been doing are not working in the change of policy. But we thank so much for you coming on today and and uh, really providing a lot of clarity on this and some very practical uh, changes that we could employ. And I really appreciate that. Thanks for coming on today with all this. My pleasure, Danny. Have a great uh, holiday, everyone. Thanks. And same to you. And when, listen, uh, folks, uh, we wish you a, a happy 4th of July. I hope you have a good time with, the, uh, with your family and friends. Uh, and, uh, and just enjoy the day. And we will see you on the next episode of Daniel Davis Deep Dive.